We are certainly well into the Halloween season now, and leading up to the holiday, I'll be sharing more New Orleans folk tales and ghost stories that are definitely true and not made up by tour guides, 100%. So I've taken you to the 700 block of Ursulines Avenue here in the French Quarter. It's pretty quiet, residential, and unfortunately cursed. There are three murders which have taken place here over the past 120 years or so, which have given rise to a pretty unfortunate reputation. The first involved a German immigrant by the name of Helga, came to this country with her husband Hans around the turn of the 20th century. They opened up a butcher shop in this red house just behind me. Should be able to see it on the left side of your frame right there. Um, uh, with uh, her husband Hans, and uh, they opened up the butcher shop, which sold what else, being Germans as they were, but sausage and beer. Now, the business was a huge success. Hans was a very gregarious fellow and made a lot of friends here in New Orleans, a lot of drinking buddies. Uh, but like many new arrivals to the city, his drinking became a bit of a problem. Put a real strain on his marriage with Helga, a strain which came to a head one morning when a young German woman by the name of Ilsa came into the shop looking for work. Now. Helga took one look at Ilsa and said, ah, uh, no, thank you so much for applying. However, we are fully staffed. Hans, though, he took one look at Ilsa and said, absolutely, we need a bookkeeper. You start tomorrow. Helga was not very happy about this. And she was even less happy when late nights out drinking with the boys turned into late nights over at Ilsa's place. And Helga stewed in bitterness and resentment, waiting night after night for Hans to come through that door so she could call him a cheating wiener schnitzel but she could never really gather up the courage. Meanwhile, Hans' affair was going beautifully, at least, you know, for Hans. And one evening at Elsa's place during pillow talk, she rolled over and said, Hansi, and he said, yeah. Said, Hansi, how would you feel about maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, and I'm just throwing out ideas here, but uh, how about we murder your wife? Hans and Elsa's sausage and beer has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Hans says, nine. I came to this country with my wife. I still sort of love my wife in a convoluted European way. I'm not going to kill my wife. That's crazy. That's insane. Not going to happen. Well, Ilsa is all upset. She starts screaming and shouting at him, and he starts screaming and shouting back. And before you know it, they're in a huge argument. So he slams the door in her face and goes back home to Helga. Now, it is a pity for everyone involved that this was the night that poor Helga finally found her courage. When Hans walked through that door, she really laid into him, saying the sorts of things that you just can't take back. So Hans did the wrong thing. He panicked. He picked up the nearest thing he could find and slapped Helga across the face with it. The nearest thing he could find was a butcher's knife, not a sausage. Or this would have been a very different story. All it takes is one hit right through the face, just she hit the, hits the ground like a ton of bricks, and she's dead instantly. And Hans panics, runs over to Ilsa's place. She says, I thought you were going back home to your wife. He said, honey, we've got bigger fish to fry. Takes her back over here and shows her what he's done. Now he's, you know, freaking out, right? He's, oh, we're gonna get caught, we're gonna get caught, we're gonna get caught. But Ilsa says, we're not gonna get caught. What we have here is a big pile of meat. And this is a butcher shop. And we have ourselves a perfectly, fully functional meat grinder. So over the next week, keeping poor Helga in a trunk, they slowly feed her into the meat grinder to be part of the day's sausage. Yum. So Ilsa had everything she wanted, Hans and Ilsa's sausage and beer, and she had Hansi's sausage all to herself, which is a terrible joke. But if you didn't see it coming, shame on you. Hans, though, uh, was not doing quite so hot. His idea of the American dream did not include feeding his dead wife to his friends and neighbors. And eventually he went a little funny in the head. So funny, in fact, that Ilsa, ironically enough, called the cops on him one night. They found him huddled naked in a ball by the meat grinder, saying over and over again, she's in there, I know she's in there, she's in there, I know she's in there. Well, men in white coats hauled him away. He spent the rest of his life in an asylum upstate. Ilsa, however, kept the butcher shop and lived off the cash for years. So if I were to give that story a happy ending rating, um, with, I don't know, one being the Red Wedding and 10 being the Lion King, I'd probably call it a six, like a healthy, solid six out of 10, which might seem generous, might seem pretty generous, but uh, once you hear the next couple stories, I think you might agree with me. So the next story takes place in this blue house, just over my shoulder here. In 1927, a butcher named Henry Moiety lived in this house with his wife, Teresa. 
Now, this was the Roaring Twenties, right? The flapper decade, the decade of women's liberation. Unfortunately, it was Teresa who was feeling liberated from Henry. She was about town with all sorts of men. Everybody knew about it. Henry's brother definitely knew about it. But Henry himself thought his wife totally incapable of adultery. Uh, though this changed somewhat when he came home a little early one evening and found her in a very compromising position with another man. Uh, so he killed them both with his butcher's knife. Now, like Hans, he didn't really know what to do, but also like Hans, he had a large antique chest, which easily accommodated both bodies once he had chopped them up, of course. And he kept those two corpses in a chest in the second story of this house for four months. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, you know? That's kind of crazy. After a couple days, wouldn't somebody just be able to smell what was going on and alert the authorities? Well, no, uh, because think about it like this. French Quarter smells bad in 2019. I can only imagine how it must have smelled 90 plus years ago and on a block known for its meat trade. So this is just one stink among hundreds of people. So Henry got away with it for a little while, but then the summer rolled around, a particularly hot summer and the contents of the chest became runny. Very runny indeed. And a maid was cleaning on the first floor when she noticed a dark viscous stain moving down the wall. Well, she called the cops. The cops found the bodies, they hauled Henry away, and he spent the rest of his life in Angola. The prison, not the country. Uh, where he actually became known as a model prisoner and uh, took up painting which is a lovely way to spend your leisure time. He actually got so good that he painted the official portrait of Huey P. Long, the governor of Louisiana at the time. And that portrait hung at the state capital of Baton Rouge for decades. I'll call that like a two out of 10 on the happy ending scale because it's always good to support the arts. Uh, this next one is considerably more depressing. Might call this like a I don't know, like a 0.4 or a 0.5 out of 10. I mean, I doubt even Review Bra has given a uh, rating quite that low. Uh, no, this one is pretty much just irredeemably tragic. It's even more tragic because of how recently it occurred. 2002, in this White House, just behind me. Now, in 02, a fellow by the name of John lived there with his girlfriend, Dana. Now, John is what you might call a deadbeat. Uh, he valued his free time, and boy, he had a lot of it. Dana, however, works two jobs including as a waitress on Bourbon Street, which is not an easy gig. Uh, paid all the rent, did all the heavy lifting in the relationship, and got little thanks for it. Uh, John, meanwhile, only worked two nights a week at the deli right next door, right at the end of the block there. Um, not really making enough even to support himself, much less contribute anything meaningful into the relationship. I mean, it'd be like if somebody in a relationship had a full-time job and the other was a struggling obscure YouTuber. It would just be completely unfair. So eventually Dana decided, you know what, I've had enough. So she went to her parents, she said, I'm gonna leave him, told her friends, I'm gonna leave New Orleans for good, start over someplace else. And eventually she broke the news to John. He did not take it very well. In fact, he stabbed her to death. And he kept her in his chest for nearly three years. Now, he didn't live here the entire time. In 2004, rent goes up in the French Quarter, so John moves in with his new girlfriend, Tracy. Same kind of a relationship. She works, he doesn't really. They actually move into a very nice house over on uh, Legion Fields Avenue. Um, and uh, Tracy's dad is the landlord, so, you know, they get a pretty sweet discount on the rent. Uh, he brings the chest, of course, and so the three of them, John, Tracy, and Dana, live happily together for about another year and a half, two years until August of 2005, when Hurricane Katrina arrives at these shores. There's a mass evacuation out of the city. John and Tracy are a part of it. However, fully expecting to be back, John leaves the chest behind. Now, a storm comes through and devastates the area. And John and Tracy decide that they would rather stay up in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they ended up, than return to a hurricane-ravaged city. Tracy's dad, however, does return in January of 2006. The first thing that he does back here in the city to check up on the damage to his property. He unlocks the door and is assailed with, and I quote directly here, the most unimaginable stench. Traces it to the chest and discovers Dana's two and a half year old mummified remains. John had actually removed her organs and packed her with salt. 
So obviously, uh, Trace's dad was completely horrified and disgusted. He dragged the chest out onto the neutral ground in the middle of the street, flagged down a passing National Guardsman who was able to get the word out to the proper channels. The cops found John in only a matter of days. He didn't resist arrest, but he did maintain a very cavalier attitude throughout the trial, even reportedly smiling and waving at Dana's parents in the courtroom. As you can imagine, this did not make the judge very sympathetic to John. Uh, he is currently serving a life sentence for what he has done, and he'll rot there till he dies. So, ladies, don't date a butcher. If you do, make sure he doesn't have any antique chests. And if these two things are completely unavoidable, don't live on this block. A big thank you to my very generous patron, the exiled tyrant. Glorious and mighty is he. He who rides with oil and bullet. Lord Reaper Paramount of the Guzzoline Horde. He who is only slightly radioactive, etc., etc. Thanks, bud.